So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the January 25th, 2024 meeting of the Budget Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of the committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. To conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Faya if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum may be maintained. Ms. Faya, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Ms. Dominowski. Mr. McMillian? Present. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Present. Ms. Han? Ms. Dominowski? Here. Ms. Dominowski, there are three members. Thank you, Ms. Faya. Will you please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting? Mr. Hartlove? Present. Mr. Tantliff? Present. If there are additional staff participating that were not mentioned, please state your name now. Thank you, Ms. Dominowski. Okay, um, on to agenda item number one. Mr. Tantliff, will you please provide an overview of the second quarter FY 2024 budget line transfer report? Sure will. Um, and we've, I think everyone here is familiar with it, but hold on, let me just move this for myself. Uh, but just a reminder, um, the budget line transfer report we've been showing to the board for a couple years now. <clears throat> and this is the request that were put in by all of the central offices and schools to move their budget uh, basically between activities. Uh, the sum of all of the BLTs throughout the year equal the budget appropriation transfer or BAT, which the board will see in April. Uh, the BAT is based on February actuals. So uh, tonight we're going to review the Q2 report, which is through December. But at the March meeting, we'll review an abbreviated Q3 report, which will be just January and February, since that will lock down the data that will feed the bat. Uh, and the main thing is we want to inform you about the bat. And uh, probably that month, we'll also uh, just do an overview of the process just to refresh people's memory uh, or to introduce uh, what we're doing with the bat for the first time. <clears throat> so, uh, you you all have this report. It's in board docs. Uh, I'm going to run through it and there's nothing out of the ordinary on this report. It's just submissions by the offices to move from point uh, A to B. Uh, so I'll run through it. And of course, uh, committee members are free to look through it um, after the meeting and, uh, you know, can ask answer more questions next month. So the first group you can see is just uh, pre-K funds. We're just moving it to where they need to be. It's all within early childhood, uh, just moving it to the appropriate objects and activities. Um, the second one's a very common uh, small one, just moving money from conference fees to overnight travel in that office. Uh, same thing here, miscellaneous contracted services to private bus con contractors. Uh, and just as a reminder, the reason we have to do it is because with a $2 billion uh, general fund budget, it, it's just impossible to budget every expense exactly how it's going to be spent. Um, and so as we learn information throughout the year, uh, none of these offices are going over budget or asking for money for outside outside of their office. Although there are uh, 
we do have those at times, either within the chief or between chiefs, especially the, the bat we do for sure. But for the most part here, this is offices just moving money from point A to point B because either they uh, planned it not quite in the right place or new information uh, has come as to the nature of how they're spending the money. Um, you can see a small one in magnet office here. These are all just very bread and butter, small budget line transfers within the same office, um, really not even worth talking about. Um, you can see throughout the organization, grounds, uh, counseling, um, uh, you know, moving money from Naviance to training. Um, here's money when it's hold back. Uh, for in this case, you've seen this before, all the money is planned centrally. And then in this case, um, the CNI team managing Spark is pushing the money out uh, to exactly where it needs to go. Um, CTE funds, these are just going out to all the schools. And actually, let me just do one thing. I have the, it hidden. We should, uh, let's see if we go back. Just for instance, if we go to room 115 where we were, you can see all the schools here. So this was just CT moving money out to the schools. Um, here's the magnet office. Uh, moving money within their program, and here's the amount over here. It's just budget realignment. Um, here's languages. Again, relatively small amounts of money, bread and butter movement. Um, this is, is uh, Michelle Stansbury's team in the Title I office, moving concentration of poverty budgets, dollars around as the schools determine how they're going to spend that money. Um, you can see more of it here. So these are all concentration of poverty, just moving money within the fixed concentration of poverty budget to where uh, the school's final budgets are. And you can see it's just realigning uh, the funds to the program need and where these schools working with the COP team determine the money needs to go. So uh, none of this is, you know, locked down when the budget gets adopted. So you can see that's what all these are. It's just COP moving money around to the school where the money is needed. So same thing here. Um, here's uh, um, career and college readiness, just moving money again to where it needs to be. Um, here they were moving money into dual enrollment from other areas of their budget. Hey, uh, with, um, yeah, just a quick thing to, to it, it may uh, be enlightening. What if you, you may not know this, but you probably do. I know it nets to zero, but what is the total positive and the total negative, you know, I know they equal each other, but do you know what it totals up to? Um, not on here. I don't think I think we'd have to go through uh, and talk. So in other words, you want to know what's the grand total of the pluses, maybe plus five million negative. Exactly. 5 million. Exactly. I don't um, I just thought it would be it would be enlightening, maybe. Uh, I I can when we go to the next topic, I can kind of do that on the side. Do some math sounds, and then let you know. Sounds good. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. No, but no interruption. Uh, here's school startup expense for Bedford, who uh, will be opening up. So this is their startup budget that the principal uh, gets to allocate. So here's their $643,000 all getting pushed out and spent. Here's more COP uh, and PPA is the uh, per pupil uh, grant. So if you recall, or you may not know, there's two 
separate um, facets of C concentration of poverty. It's the same umbrella, but they are separate allocations. Uh, and the um, PPA is a subset of the main grant with different criteria that gets uh, stacked on and gets spent in a slightly different way. So you can see COP and the PPA grant. Um, here's startup again for the new Northeast Middle School. Um, here's COP. So you can see very repetitive bread and butter stuff. You know, you saw a lot of smaller ones early on. Um, this is just blueprint as we start up the year. Um, you know, took till the second quarter to get everything finalized and moved around. Uh, here's a small one for dance, and then uh, here's just early childhood. Um, <clears throat> just uh, moving money into the correct activity. So it's still early childhood pre-K, but it was just in the wrong place when it initially got budgeted. So that just got moved to the correct place. So that's really uh, all there is to it, we we just want to be very transparent and let you uh, see what's happening each quarter um, and ask questions if you have any. I know normally in the beginning of the year, because you haven't seen it for a while, there's more questions and more line items, quite frankly, because we're pushing out a lot of the central budgets and people, you know, it's been a year. If you remember people in a, this wasn't a typical year in 25, but normally, Central offices are submitting their budget in um, by the end of September. So you can see even by the time the year starts, nine months have already gone by. And then once you're into Q1 and Q2, it's more than a year. So you can see easily how um, either how you're spending some of the money has changed or and a lot of times we don't know exactly uh, where it'll be budgeted and we have more information by the time the year starts. So uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, but that's all I have on the report. Here, would anyone, uh, does anyone have any questions to start with? I, don't um, have I, have a, I have a few um, and I'm not sure if you can answer these or if we're going to cover this in the next agenda item. I guess I'm just confused by some of the the headings like under concentration of power, ha power, pa poverty. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, where am I going to go back to where I, um, how the transfer goes as far as um, so like um, I don't know, that's concentration of poverty. There's a bunch of them like Scotts Branch, Halthorpe, Lansdowne, Berkshire, Chadwick, Ray, Rosedale, Halstead, Logan, and Powhatan, so Powhatan as, as far mm -hmm. as I've gotten so far. Um, with the, um, you know, conference registration fees, overnight travel expenses, mileage reimbursement, phone stipends. How is, um, I, I just don't, can you explain how that's um, considered concentration of poverty funds? Um, well, I, yes, I can answer that question at a high level, but uh, to go deep into all the ways to spend, um, you know, we would need to talk with Michelle Stansberry and Mel Melissa Wistead. Okay. But, um, you know, you have a number of employees that are funded uh, under concentration of poverty. Those employees may need to drive somewhere. They may need to go to a conference to uh, receive training and background in what they're doing. So the wraparound services and all the support, you know, we're spending a lot of money on concentration of poverty. I mean, it's surpassing, it'll be surpassing Title I. So when you have a number of employees, they're gonna have to do support activities too. So it's not just paying the employees. It's, you know, if an employee has to drive to another school, we give them a mileage reimbursement. If they're going to a conference that makes sense as an, and is approved within the rules of COP, and COP has 
very specific rules on par, you know, with a restrictive grant like Title I, maybe not quite as restrictive, but uh, very rigid rules. Uh, but, you know, if you look at Title I, people are going to get reimbursed for mileage. They're going to go to conferences. Most of the money is spent on the people and the contracts that are supporting the wraparound services. Hope that helps. Yes, it does. Um, so where, as far as like, where would, if you were going to pull out, you know, what we're spending as far as, you know, conferences and overnight travel expenses, would this get pulled out? What department would this be pulled out under? Concentration of poverty or under? Well, it's under C&I. C&I, okay. That's what you mean, which chief is it under? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then I had one other. Uh, Oh, the special education extended school year. Mm -hmm. What does what what is? I'm just. Can you explain that one? What is? Um, yeah, I'm not sure which line it's on, but it's a yeah. Uh, it's, it's page three. Uh, okay. <clears throat> uh, but that would be the summer program. So, uh, um, we were probably doing. Uh, 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 let me look at the PDF so I can find exactly where you are. Page three, uh, like about in the middle somewhere. Yeah. Special education, special ed instructional, and. St Extended school year. Yeah, 2. sorry. Two point nine million. Okay. Uh, oh, can I jump in and say something about that while you're looking um, it up? So, Ms. Dominowski, um, there's certain requirements by state and federal law that the school system must do for special for students um, receiving special education services. And some of these services happen in the summer. So when we're looking at this budget, um, you know, the, the money that you see there, a lot of it is tied to what is federally and state required. Okay. So we have to allocate that whether it's used or not. You know, um, hold on, let me. And, and Ms. Dominowski, remember that this, these are all the movements from, from the original budget. Um, so, right. so I think as we're moving through the year, I think Mr. Tantliff kind of referred to this a little bit. As we move through the year and we get more uh, definition as to what we're doing, that's when we can get more um, specific with the plans. Um, so, um, so you're you're seeing um, some increases and some decreases. The increases are probably things that we didn't know enough about when we were putting the budget together. So we may not have budgeted any amount, or we may have budgeted a very low amount. And then as we go through the year and we start to determine, you know, that we're going to need some some funds in a particular area, then through the the uh, BLT we we move those funds. Okay. Yeah, this was, um, is this what, uh, Ms. Dominowski, is this what you're looking at, the 2.9 million here? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so if you look right here, see it was, it was, it was in holdback to begin with. Okay. Holdback means we, we have to get the, we, we plan it centrally and then push it all out to the school. So that's what's happening here. So you can you see it was holdback, negative okay. two point. Seven million. So we moved it. We moved it from the central office just to where it needed to be. The extended school year uh, budget. Uh, this is all instructional uh, salaries to basically pay the stipends that we pay the teachers in the summer to do the special ed summer program. And Mr. Tant, with the holdback is is I just want to make sure I because I may not understand this exactly, but the holdback is also uh, enrollment related to? Is that the case because you you want to allocate out to schools based upon actual enrollment? Uh, well, this is a little different. Um, this is 
just the the sent the special ed summer program starts centrally and then gets expended based on how spe I mean it's not really per pupil because it's special ed so the the money and the number of people vary based on the program and who's in there in the summer and what needs they have but it's just that this budget we do not plan it we do not adopt it by school we have the full budget centrally um, and then it needs to get expended so it all was just sitting uh, in one line item now here we don't push it out to each school all the salaries um, come and hit one place but it just needed to get moved into the special ed department to receive the expenditures um, what you're thinking about, Chris, is, re is really like the per pupil budget. We always hold back some of it to true it up to enrollment. So that gets allocated by enrollment and then it gets trued up by enrollment. And in Q1, we see uh, a ton of that get pushed out because the schools, um, we do not capture the school's plan and the adopted budget. It's all, there's a number of buckets that we have to, we just plan it all centrally and then we push it out to the either each school or push it out to the correct place where it uh, needs to go. And, so, and, and thank, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just was going to ask, are these um, are these grant funded or is this like BCPS budget? Nothing on here is grants. The okay. BAT and this report is only the general fund operating budget. Okay, so I guess what I was trying to get at is like we have to sh set that, that 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 money aside for special education in the summer before we even know how many students we have to take care of or who need or who are going to be attending or taken care of so that money is going to be spent or is set aside well, we, to be spent regardless well we plan well we plan the budget based on historical based on you know if special ed thinks something's changing uh we might increase it based on if the amount they're going to get paid per day is increasing, like typically with a COLA, it might go up. Uh, and so we plan it centrally and then um, based on the actual needs, that's how we expend it. So in a perfect world, we'll spend exactly how much is budgeted. Now, it'll never work out to exactly that, especially in a budget like this. Um, so it might go over budget and we need to pull money from elsewhere to cover it. Um, it if it's under budget, uh, it may go to fund balance at the end of the year or typically special ed is an area where expenditures have been over years and years rapidly increasing and we're sort of always chasing our tail in the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that's driven by non-public placement um so it may just need to cover other areas of overspending in special ed but it's like really any budget that we plan um for the regular summer school budget special ed um the amount of money we plan to give edas those are the stipends to be like managed clubs and stuff like that there's some things we can completely we can control the spend so for instance edas uh, you know, we can allocate exactly the right amount to schools to exactly equal the budget. Special ed, summer school is a little tougher to get precise because you don't know which kids are going to show up, um, right. which for summer school in general is true. And you don't know what the needs are going to be and where they're going to be. So, you know, I hope that's just wondering if that's something we could look into the future as far as like auditing that. You know, are, are we meeting the needs or exceeding the needs or, you know, I, I, I just would like to see the the registration numbers for that. So I, I thought I, you're not, you know what I mean? Like down. Yeah, I is, think is that would be a request. Fact, you know, like, that, yeah, like that, we do any retrospect that. after the fact, like, hey, this is what we, this is what we sent out and what we invited to come to summer school, but this is what we actually got. Sure. Did we? I, I think, yeah, yeah that, that wouldn't be a budget question, though. That would wait, be. So, yeah, I, can I just question. jump in here really quick, uh, um, Ms. Seminoski? Um, so, so this is the concern that I have, right? Because looking at this budget in isolation of the context around it, 
it's not going to allow us to make any type of informed decisions or even um, have a full understanding of the full picture. Because right now we're just looking at numbers in isolation of the context. And so this is why I think certain things from the budget committee needs to come before the full board and it has to be a collaborative presentation with you know the, the, the finance office and whatever that content is so that we could have a full understanding to make an informed decision. Because a lot of the questions um, that you're asking are really content specific that I don't think is, um, you know, it's really out of the, the scope of the, the financial office to address. And so, that, so that's just my only concern. Like I received the, the document, I looked over it, it's great, um, but without the context behind it, I don't really know what we're supposed to do with it or what we're supposed to, um, what actions are we supposed to take or what decisions will it inform. And so I almost feel like something like this needs to be before the full board and the context needs to, to be there. So just like your questions about summer school, we would have a better understanding of, okay, who's enrolled, how much money, so that we can see the full picture instead of, you know, these bite-sized pieces where they're not connecting. Um, so it's just my, I, I just think it'll be better if these types of uh, topics are brought for the full board and there's a joint presentation with finance and the content area so we could see the full, under, have the full understanding of what's happening and then use what to inform to make some decisions. But right now, just looking at the numbers, it's, I don't know what we're supposed to do with that. Um, Other than balance the checkbook. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Yeah, no, what I was going to say, Ms. Booker Dwyer, I think those are, are very good points. And and I understand when we bring this forward, it does open up like, OK, what about the program programmatic part of this? And that's not really why we're here. You know, those questions, you, you, you can't help yourself, but ask them, but they really are not. You know, we don't have all the program people here, but I think the initiative and I kind of inherited this. We inherited this um, uh, this part of the meeting. Um, you know, we will bring a bat forward um, in April, as Mr. Tantliff said, and this is really just to say um, there's a lot of detail that goes beneath that that bat, and this is to show kind of the process and, um, you know, shows what's behind those. You know, when you get the bat, it'll be a very summarized uh, document. It won't be this, it won't be a spreadsheet like this. Uh, to this extent. So this is for those folks who love to dive into the details. Um, this is kind of shows them what is behind that bat, but it really is meant to be just um, uh, detail of, of, de uh, of the specifics behind larger numbers that you'll see in April. That's that's really what it is, and it's not here for a programmatic discussion. And I and I agree with you because we're not really uh, Mr. Tantliff and myself were not the program people. Thank you for that clarification. Okay, uh, was right, uh, Mr. McMillian. Did you have any questions about the bat? At the, the no, no, thank you. Okay. Move on. Then. If there's no further questions, we'll move on to the next agenda item, um, which the we're uh, it's just a, a question and answer about budget, the fiscal year budget 2025. Um, and in this agenda, we're going to go over the conference expenditure spending. Gosh, why can't I talk today? Conference spending and travel overnight travel. Um, yes, and I, and oh, I did get wait, that. I have one I'm sorry. question. So before we get started, because I just want to make sure I have the context right. What are we supposed to do with this information? I know that, you know, educators are required to, to attend certain events. To, you know, it helps maintain their credentialing. And so we see these, and I don't know, I mean, Ms. Dominowski, what was the vision around seeing this document? What, what action or what information, how do you want us to use this information? I just needed that context setting because I saw the document, but I wasn't sure what I was supposed to do with it without having the context of the purpose of the conference and, you know, some of the other things behind it. Uh, I, I was 
Okay. My context behind it was that we're coming towards a fiscal cliff and I was I'm glad to see some reduction in some of this spending um, because if we're asking schools to make reductions, I would like us to make reductions as well. And I'm thinking that some of the conferences that we are you know, spending a lot of money on, like what are we getting out of it? So I'm actually, I'm, I'm, and that's not something that Mr. Tantliff and Mr. Harlow can answer, but I wanted to see the changes that we're, you know, proposing in the fiscal year, which I'm, I'm happy to see. And I'm not so happy to see how much we spent in 23, but um, it just, that was, I thought the public deserved to know what we were spending, you know, that wasn't directly related to going to a school building and helping out a school building or there, if that makes sense. No, that makes total sense. And, and we just have to, once again, the context matters. So the blueprint is being rolled out. We have science of reading being rolled out. And so it would be expected that we should see an increase in professional learning for our teachers so that they can bring it back into the schools because you know they haven't been trained on it. You have a teacher who may have been teaching for 20 years has not been fully trained on the science of reading, so we need to invest in those teachers. So I just don't want the public to look at these numbers out of context. There's a lot of change happening in Maryland right now, especially with the blueprint, and I think we all need more professional development with that. So I would actually expect to see an increase in the, the amount of money that's being spent on professional learning so that our teachers, our, our leaders in the schools, and the central office staff understand what they need to do to move the school system forward because what's been work what we've done in the past hasn't really worked so there's a time to so this is a time to recalibrate and whenever you recalibrate it takes an increased investment so once again i just don't want to look at this out of context and just see the the numbers without understanding the why behind it with the blueprint science of reading new math curriculum new english language arts curriculum a significant amount of professional learning is required and so, um, so I don't want to look at this as, oh, this is increase or decrease. There are increases needed because of all the new initiatives that are coming out. Um, so, so that's the only thing that, um, you know, I, I would just caution the public as they're looking at these numbers not to rush to judgment without understanding the context of why this professional learning is needed. Well, which is why I actually I, I originally asked for the context of it too, as far as you know where. I believe I totally understand what you're saying as far as professional development, but you can professionally development over, you know, virtual and, you know, virtual conferences, not traveling to, you know, a, out of state. Those were the things I was looking at, what we were spending um, as far as conferences, overnight travel, that kind of thing, not as much, you know, professional development, teaching, um, going to, you know, in state conferences that were here for our, our full staff. I was more, um, looking at a smaller and, and subset so, and i think that's what so you brought forward i don't think we're spending thousands of dollars on you know uh professional development that's coming over um virtually in a session you know with the hmh and delarming or the other the new math curriculum it's more the um the bigger conferences that i was concerned about Right, and, and I just want to caution us too, is that when we think about effective practices for adult learners, the virtual learning um, does not have the same impact and the return on investment as the in-person session. And as we think about differentiating the learning to meet the needs of the different adult learners, because so just like with students, we have adults with special needs, virtual learning doesn't meet, always meet their needs. And so these in-person sessions are essential. It's, there's been all kinds of studies done around the virtual versus the impact of virtual versus in person. In virtual, you can, I mean, after an hour and a half, you're, you're pretty much done. People have tuned out. In person, you could sustain the, the training much longer and, and do a lot more interaction than you can virtually. So once again, that context matters. And I think we have to look at what's the research base behind what the school system is doing what the professional learning is that they're doing to align to the research base, I and mean, then what is our return on investment? And then I think that is where the budget discussion needs to happen is, you know, I don't mind spending thousands of dollars if the return on investment is our students are improving and, you know, we're seeing that return. But if we're not seeing that, then that's when we need to say, okay, we need to pivot and move something up and do something else. So We're on um, the same page. So I just, we're on the same page. I completely agree with you. I think this is just the it. first step. Yeah. 
uh, and I, I love that you said the virtual learning. I, I, I hope we get we never force that on our kids again either as far as you know, not everybody learns the same way. So I, I completely right, agree right. with you on that. So yeah, and we saw 100%. So I think this was just kind of the first step to getting this conversation started. I, I, I want to see the return on investment as well. So, and so maybe uh, then the question is maybe, you know, as we're thinking about agenda planning for the beat board meeting, we could look at, you know, the professional learning that our teachers are getting, you know, yes. the cost that it is, uh, and then what are the expected outcomes so that we could kind of see the big picture. Because once again, right. looking at the sheet is, you know, one snapshot, but it doesn't tell the whole story. And I just, I don't want the public to think that, oh, they're spending X amount of dollars on professional learning. Um, without understanding the backstory and the purpose of it. So right. I think we're on the same page, Ms. Dominowski. Yes. How many people, how many, oh. with the professional development, how many teachers are we affecting with that conference as opposed to, you know, the, the smaller conference where we might send, you know, a couple, you know, principals here and there, like how is that affect, what's, what's the most effective way to spend this money and to help our kids? What has the best, what's driving student outcomes and what's not? So, yep, yes. I like that. So that I think could be the discussion for the full board, um, and I will try to work that into an agenda um, so that we could truly see that that return on investment. Perfect. Sounds good to me. <laughs> okay, with that, I'll just share. I'll share my screen, and I think that was a really good um, discussion. Can everyone see uh, see the report? Um, so I I think every that was all very, very good discussion. And I, some of the things that we were talking about earlier are the same types of of things. We're you know, you can only tell so much from a number. You know, a number uh, uh, um, doesn't mean a lot without the context. But but what we can take out of this um, is maybe a little bit of a uh, of a discussion of how we looked at our budget this year. So I'll go through the, the, the report briefly and just kind of give you a, a, an overview. Basically, the request was for um, the uh, by department. So we have the list of the departments and they are they're under their uh, the division, the, the particular chief that they're under. Um, you'll see that we have the um, the if you start over the over to the right, you'll see the 22 actuals. Then you'll see a column for the 23 actuals. That's actual expenditures within that area. And then the FY24 um, year to date actuals uh, uh, as of we ran the report today uh, or uh, yes, this morning. And then um, you'll see last you'll see the current year's adopted budget FY24 and then the proposed uh, budget for FY FY25. So um, I'm trying to find one here uh, that would be a good um, example. Um, if we look at, let's see if I can, and, and I guess you'll see that you know we start off with the chief, with the board of education, the chief academic officer, chief financial officer, chief human resources uh, officer, uh, chief information officer, chief of schools, chief of staff. Um, chief operating officer and then the superintendent and then schools at the very bottom. And I guess the first thing I should say is, is that um, schools were not touched in this uh, in the in the budget in the zero based budgeting process. We didn't we didn't impact their uh, spending at all. The reason you're seeing a, a zero in the 25 proposed is that right now their dollars are in a more generic uh, budget and in in the April time frame, they will then allocate their budgets out to the very the specific um, areas. So this will, I'm assuming, will be something comparable to what it's been in the past, depending on what the school's plans are for professional development. If they need more professional development, this 213,000 that is budgeted in the current year may go up a bit. If they have less, if they're seeing less uh, uh, professional de development, it may go, go down a, a, a bit. Um, so if you look at the school line, you'll see in 22 uh, schools spent a total of $71,545. In FY23, they spent $210,315. And year to date, they spent $46,582. Um, and the current budget is $213,700. $36. Um, the bottom line on all of these items, both central office and schools, is we've spent 
We have a budget, a current budget of $449,000. We've spent about that same amount uh, in 22, in 23, and in 24, we are, uh, we're seven months in and we've spent 227,000. So if you, if you, uh, extend that out, uh, we're probably going to be in the $400,000 range this year. Uh, you'll see that the budget for next year is significantly less. Now, we, I do want to point out that we don't have the 213 in here. So once you add that in, we're going to be, uh, you know, somewhere around the 300,000, 300 and low 300,000. So we've, we've reduced uh, travel uh, conference and registration fees by more than $100,000. All of that being in 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 central central office to talk about what we can't talk about the you know the specifics of it, but we can talk about the process and uh, what I saw from from. Uh, Dr. Rogers is asking tough questions about um, value. First of all, valuing uh, conferences and professional development, but also asking what we're what we're getting in return for those things and keeping the things that we get a high turn we get a high return on and eliminating those that are um, not uh, giving us the bang for the buck so we're trying to concentrate into the things um, that make a, a a difference we we believe professional development is very important but we want it to be quality and we want it to be focused on where we're trying to take the the school system now, with all of this, the, the, the value of professional development is something that's um, I think is subjective. Uh, we could send staff to a professional development, a conference, and that that uh, that teacher or that principal may get a tremendous amount of, of knowledge and may make them a much better teacher or a much better principal or a much better accountant um, than they were before. And that we would all say that's good professional development. We could also send uh, you know, a teacher or a principal or, or, or someone to a, uh, to a conference and they don't get much out of it. And that's that we would say that's not good professional development. So and you can't get that from the, from the numbers. You get that from um, actually uh, uh, seeing what people come back with and how effective they they, they are, uh, we're big believers in in you know professional development and um, but we want it to be quality and that was what this process was all about was focusing, prioritizing and making sure that the dollars are going towards quality professional development that will uh, improve school system um, efficiency, effectiveness and most importantly student academic. Uh, achievement. So um, I think that's about as much as I can say. You see the numbers. The zero-based budgeting did uh, did reduce the budget. This is what we we did come in and tried to really uh, 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 put a critical eye to professional to to all spending, um, including uh, professional development, specifically central centralized. We we didn't impact the schools with with, with this uh, exercise. Um, so uh, uh, I think that's all I wanted to say. I guess at this point I can open it up for 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 questions. Did anyone else have any questions, Brad? Yes. I just I just have a statement. You know, it's so hard to quantify the impact of professional development. And all the different stuff that I've taken over the years, it's it's what you bring back and use in the classroom setting. And so how do you put a price tag on that? How do you know that that's valuable? You know, somebody might go to a conference and they might give it their total 100 percent concentration and, you know, they avoid the, the restaurants and everything and they just go there and they do their thing. But that doesn't mean that when they go back, they implement that in the classroom. So all this discussion, but we really don't, you don't know the true value of the impact it's having in the classroom. That's my point. You just don't know. And and you're never going to, how, you can't quantify yeah. that. And so, I think you're getting, you're hitting on the same point that Ms. Booker Dwyer was, 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 was making that we should, you know, we should really be talking about, you know, these are the numbers, and this is really more about the budget process. Um, 
and we can tell you that we did try to prioritize and 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 um, try to identify things that we thought were valuable, but the true uh, a value is is tougher to um, to discern, and you really need to talk about where you know what professional development we're we're attending and what we're trying to get out of it. We we know as we as we you know look at our curriculum as we try to uh, uh, we know what we're currently doing is not working to the extent that we want it to work. So uh, we know where we want our teachers to be, and I think the way you determine whether professional development is good or not is does the professional development start to move us towards where we want to where we want to be and um, that's uh, I think ultimately it's going to be uh, measured by student academic performance over the long term. I think that's that's because a, a lot of it will will ultimately be judgments. I think you hit the nail on the head Mr. McMillian when you said you know, somebody can go they can put put everything into it but if if we're if they're learning things that aren't going to come back and be helpful or, or you know or even if they they were good things but then we don't put them into practice um it's not very worth worthwhile and, and that's where it goes back to the individual the individual has to implement use that information in the classroom if they might have it but if they're not willing to to you know to implement it then it's that it's a waste on all and you don't know that person they're, and they're all across the system you know, some of them are going to take that information. They're going to go in and they're going to have an impact where others are not going to do anything with it. So, you, you know, you just don't know. Hey, can I jump in here? Um, so Mr. McMillan, you make an excellent point. And this is why that that professional learning system has to be aligned. And it's up to like the school leaders, department chairs to go and, and see those classrooms to see if the teacher is actually implementing what was a part of that professional learning. So it has to be an aligned system. So you're absolutely right. It can't just be one teacher going off to a conference and then coming back and no one knows what was discussed at the conference, what was going to, you know, how it's going to be implemented in the class. I and mean, there's no accountability or follow up when it comes back. So you're absolutely right, Mr. McMillian. Um, th there has to be some type of accountability or something happening at the school level where you're actually seeing whatever was taught in action. So I think the way that they're doing H, the, the, the English language arts curriculum, where they have the coaches going in, where the principals are being trained and you can see what's happening, we should see effectiveness in that. But then the one-off, um, that's, that's what would be, you know, where we would have a harder time quantifying um, whether or not that, that was effective. It, it, and I can say, you know, one more, and I probably already said this, but the 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 pro, I can speak to the budgeting process, and I can speak to the fact that it, uh, um, the superintendent was very involved in the budget process, budgeting process, and asked a lot of tough questions um, that made people, re, re, you know, go back to the drawing board and say, okay. How am I, you know, what am I trying to get out of professional development and what works and what doesn't work and what should I be budgeting for and where can we save dollars to go put them towards um, things that are going to uh, help improve uh, student academic achievement? That was what those questions over over and over again. And this is kind of the result of that on a very small, in a very small, just looking at conferences. Um, and this is a, 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 a an example of that. Thank you. I, it sounded like I, 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 I wanted this kind of message to get out. I, I feel like Dr. Rogers was on the same page as I was thinking this would go, and I wanted that message to get out that we were thinking that way. So I'm glad that we got this talk together, and I'm um, thank you for the presentation and letting us know um, back, you know, a little what was going on. It was very obvious that she was very involved in the budget, so it was. It was good. Um, if anybody has any more questions about this topic or if not, then the next item is announcements. The next budget meet, committee meeting is February 21st, 2024. Right now, uh, I guess it, it sounds like, Tierra, you want to have, Ms. Booker, you want to have a conversation about well, moving forward with the budget committee. 
I agree with you in that um, what we do here is just look at the numbers, which is hard to it's it's like balancing a checkbook. Basically, we can look at the numbers, but without knowing the full context, it doesn't really do us any good. So I would like to figure out a way to have a budget agenda item on the main board on our on our board meetings. Um, and so we could bring in, you know, other departments to explain, you know, what this money is spent for, what are we getting out of it? We need to start seeing some results so that, you know, we can justify spending, you know, 2.9 million on this or whatever the case may be. So I, I do like that that goal for the budget committee. But if there's any no further business. Hearing none, this meeting is now adjourned. I thank you all for joining us and have a great evening. Have a good night. Thank, thank night. you very much.